It's all about that last act. The reason readers go on to recommend a book and spread that amazing word of mouth engine is the third arc. We're going to use Jane Eyre's example to learn how to build up your positive character arc so the last act moves your readers as much as Jane Eyre probably moved you. Basically, we're about to figure out how it's done so you can do it to your own character. Here's Robert McKee on the subject. He uses a, another temporal art film, but it's exactly the same thing applies. A revered Hollywood axiom warns, movies are about their last 20 minutes. In other words, for a film to have a chance in the world, the last act and its climax must be the most satisfying experience of all. Here's an example. For the first 80 minutes of Blind Date, Kim Bassinger and Bruce Willis careen through this farce, exploding laugh after laugh. But with the Act 2 climax, all laughter ceased. Act 3 fell flat, and what should have been a hit went south. Kiss of the Spider Woman, on the other hand, opened with a tedious 30 or 40 minutes. But gradually the film drew us into deep involvement and built pace until the story climax moved us as few dramas do. Word of mouth gave the film legs and William Hurt got an Oscar. In this video, I assume you know the basics about creating character and character arcs. If you don't, check out how to create great characters and positive character arc Ready Player One. The links are in the description. In this video, we're using K.M. Whelan's Creating Character Arcs. Jane Eyre's want is to have love. Her need is to have autonomy, including moral autonomy. Her lie is that love requires suffering. In Act 1, Jane Eyre's normal world is established, and it's a loveless, cruelly unjust world. She's hungry for even a morsel of love. Here's what she tells her aunt, who was forced to take her in. You think I have no feelings and that I can do without one bit of love or kindness, but I cannot live so and you have no pity. But we also see her need in her personality traits. We see how much moral autonomy matters. She's utterly honest, even when the consequences of her honesty make life very difficult. She is sent to a boarding school, a religious school that's free, where they basically starve the students. Her lie is reinforced when she says to the only friend that she makes there, to gain some real affection from you or Miss Temple or any other whom I truly love, I would willingly submit to have the bone of my arm broken or to let a bull toss me or to stand behind a kicking horse and let it dash its hoof at my chest. That's how much this little girl wants just a morsel of love. The first act shows why the character believes their lie and it strengthens that lie. Then the character must make a decision to leave the normal world. This is the inciting incident in the story arc. At the first plot point, Jane Eyre becomes a governess and moves to Thornfield. It's important to note to underscore the fact that I said decision. This must always, this should always be a decision on the character's part. It shouldn't just happen to them. In the first half of Act 2, there are a series of interactions with Mr. Rochester, which lead Jane to fall in love with him. And now her, her want is even more specific. She wants to be loved by him. So what distinguishes the first half of Act 2 is that, in a character arc, is that the character actively pursues her want, her goals, but all the actions she undertakes are ineffective. So Jane has long conversations with Mr. Rochester. She even saves his life from a fire. Uh, it just doesn't lead anywhere. Then Blanche Ingram appears to show Jane Eyre exactly what she's up against. This is the big obstacle that's placed before what she wants. And Blanche Ingram is, of course, absolutely beautiful, very charming, um, a socialite, very wealthy, everything that Jane is not. Now we get to the midpoint. Wieland has called this the most important part of um, a character arc. At the midpoint, the character must take an action which demonstrates that they've accepted a part of the truth. 
Jane Eyre makes a significant decision at the midpoint. She's been led to understand that Rochester will marry Blanche and needs to distance herself from him. She receives an invitation from her dying aunt to return home and she decides to undertake this long journey and leave Thornfield temporarily but still to, to really impose that physical distance as well. She also tells Rochester that she and her student Adele must be safe out of the house before his new bride enters it. This is her asserting her autonomy, revealing that she's understood a part of her truth, although she still loves him. And that's the important thing if you remember about the second half of Act 2, is that the character holds two conflicting beliefs, sometimes conflicting, at the same time, They're, they believe their lies still, and now they also believe their truth. K.M. Whelan says, the result is cognitive dissonance. She's trapped between two incompatible beliefs. Even when it seems like she's gotten everything she ever wanted, the love of this man that she loves, and he's asked her to marry him. Yet, something is amiss. There's not, I mean, there's, there's great joy and there's great happiness, but there are also all these strange signs. Mrs. Fairfax, her friend and the housekeeper, isn't very happy about the news. She feels unsettled, almost fearful, when Rochester calls her Mrs. Rochester for the first time. She feels uncomfortable with him getting her to try on jewels and fine clothing. The more he bought me, the more my cheek burned with a sense of annoyance and degradation. And of course, she wakes up in the middle of the night to find a strange woman tearing her expensive wedding veal in half. Wedding. Veil. Veil. <laughs> but despite all these unusual occurrences, at the beginning of the third act, she's moving closer to what she wants, and she's at the church marrying Mr. Rochester. That's when disaster strikes. Because that's what happens in a positive character arc. When a character is about to get what they want, everything they ever wanted, by ignoring their needs. It's revealed that Mr. Rochester, of course, is already married to a, a mad woman who lives in the attic and who tore the veil. To be with him now would actually mean to be his mistress. And that would be a rejection of her moral autonomy, of her truth. It's the worst possible outcome for Jane. We've been with her through the first act when she endured so much suffering and she was in just a completely loveless environment and now finally she has someone she loves and respects and she's she has to make this enormous sacrifice which is to actually walk away from that to leave that because there's such an integral part of her that requires autonomy that requires in this case especially moral autonomy this is what makes Jane Eyre such a fascinating character and such an amazing novel. It's, the, it's that critical sacrifice. It's that key decision. It's walking away from everything she ever wanted, everything that's been built up throughout the novel. It's actually choosing to walk away from that in exchange for her truth, in exchange for the, what makes her a whole person, what makes her respect herself. She walks away from love. The, a child that, of all the characters we've read, or mo many of them, um, is one who has really been desperate for love. If you can bring your character to that point where they choose to sacrifice everything they've truly, truly wanted, that you've built the novel up towards, then you know you have a golden character arc on your hands. Poor and friendless, Jane Eyre goes out into the countryside Jane! Jane! without any plan, any, any destination in mind, not knowing what, what might befall her. Eventually she finds her footing. She inherits a fortune from an uncle. And when her cousin asked her to marry him in a loveless marriage that would be based on servitude in India, which if you remember, was an important part of her lie, 
it's very easy for her to say no. She's achieved an inner strength that allows her to reject the proposal with ease. At the climax, Jane Eyre hears Rochester's voice calling out for her. When she returns to Thornfield to find Rochester, it is as a financially independent woman, but also a woman who is very comfortable within her own skin, a woman who knows herself completely. There she discovers that Rochester's wife had set fire to the manor, and in trying to save her, it, Rochester is now blind and his arm is mutilated. They're reunited, and in his current state, it's clear that Rochester will be dependent on Jane. She'll be his sight. She'll help him physically, since he no longer has the use of his right arm. She's also financially independent. She's, he recognizes her moral strength. Jane has complete autonomy. And she also has her want, love. But she had to give up what she wanted first. She had to give up the love in order to get both, ultimately. And that's okay, whether the character gets their want or not is irrelevant. In this case, she does. But the critical thing is that she had to sacrifice it first. If that sacrifice hadn't been made, then she wouldn't have gotten both. As writers, we reveal characters through the choices they make. This is the most powerful tool you have as a writer. Think about the choices your character makes. It's not about how you describe them. It's not about what other people say about them. It's the decisions they make, the actions that they take. When you're thinking about the ultimate choice your character needs to make in the third act, if it's a positive character arc, make them completely relinquish their want. Make it, a, make it the most difficult choice they're ever going to make, that you could ever conceive of, that you could ever imagine for this person. They should choose their truth at great personal sacrifice. If you have a similar character arc, tell us about your character's gut-wrenching decision in the third arc in the comments below. And if you're reading below, choose three comments to give a thumbs up to that you, you really speak to you. I'll see you guys in the comments. Oh, and give this video a thumbs up if, if you liked it and you learned something. Bye.